Hey, Wildcats. Now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on that note, we'll probably get started. Oh, good, we just lost half. Of it. I know, yeah, I yeah, had yeah, that effect like, on yeah, it. It's too funny. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're thrilled to have you on. I am Jamie Weatherby. I'm the Associate Director of Engagement, um, focusing on professional development here at UNH. Um, you've heard my voice before, but this is the first time I've had an opportunity to be on camera, so this is a lot of fun. Um, today, I am joined by uh, Butch at Earth Eagle Brewing to my immediate left. Um, he is a, two, uh, not 2000, sorry, I was jumping ahead, uh, in 1983 grad. Um, then we have Dagan, uh, Dane and Dagan, I have you wrong on my sheet, um, who are both 2008 grads um, here from Liars Bench Brewing. Um, here to talk a little bit about their brewing experience, some advice and tips and tricks that they've learned along the way um, of their brewing journey. Um, so if you, we're going to get started. Um, what I would love to do is just have you share a little intro about yourself and talk about what interested you in brewing in the first place. Okay, well, uh, Butch Heilshorn, co-founder of Earth Eagle Brewings, uh, along with my uh, brother-in-law, Alex McDonald. Um, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I've always been a beer geek, you know, I've always been very interested in different beers and different breweries and different styles and that type of thing. And was always, you know, looking for unusual stuff, at, you know, after a certain point. And, um, it got to the point where my knowledge about beer got way ahead of what was available on the market. And, uh, that's a right around the time that I met Alex and we decided, well, if we can't buy these beers, let's make them. Okay. So we were kind of off to the races at that point. Very cool. And how about you guys? Uh, Dane Nielsen uh, of Liars Bench Beer Company in Portsmouth. Uh, I guess it's, I mean, it really started back in high school um, with my dad. He was a home brewer and it piqued some interest in me, but not to the, the geekdom that, um, Butch found immediately uh, it was more of the, the alcohol that I was trying to take to the party. We're supposed um, to talk about that, man. <laughs> I know. We oh, that's not had part of beer? Should. Don't condone underage drinking. I know. We should have um, had beer. <laughs> we thought about it. We thought about it. I'm really thirsty. Uh, but that did spur the interest later on. Um, I found myself in San Francisco, uh, and I was uh, at a brew club, met the head brewer there, and he invited me down week after week, and I started volunteering, and it really – caught fire um and i couldn't i couldn't rest until i started brewing professionally and i did and uh not turning back uh, and i'm not actually a brewer um i've been working in restaurants since i was 14. uh dave and i are actually freshman roommate randomly roomed together at christensen packed into a forced triple hey jim um, hey jim hope you're watching buddy uh, <laughs> so we you know we were fast friends from the very beginning like I said, I've been working in the restaurant industry for years and years. I uh, was working in Portsmouth predominantly, doing everything from busting tables to inevitably opening restaurants as the general manager. Uh, and I got really piqued on the, uh, just the vibe and the culture of brew pubs and craft brewing when I went out to visit Dave in San Francisco and he brought me to Magnolia. Uh, and when you walk into that establishment, you just, get a sense of, of community, of being in a progressive, independent place. Uh, and that just struck a chord with me. So I think it was probably four years ago now that, uh, that he and I started having serious conversations about doing something on our own. And after that, it was just the momentum took over. So awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience. Um, I would imagine a lot of the folks that are joining us on the webinar are interested in getting into brewing themselves and interested in the first step. So you have this idea of wanting to get into brewing, but what do you do from that idea and what steps did you guys take to actually make that um, a reality for you? Well, uh, for, uh, for Alex and I, uh, he had actually home brewed a couple times, I don't know, maybe 10 years before we had met. Uh, I was really trying to, it, it, it's weird to, to talk about it like this now, but I was really threatened by trying to brew beer. Like it, there was just some weird thing about it. And I didn't have any buddies at breweries. I had no way to really, uh, you know, experience that without going kind of whole hog into it. 
And um, so uh, I was, you know, again, trying to screw up my courage to, to do this. And then meeting Alex, I was like, oh, well, you know, I've done that before. We, let's go. I was like, all right, we're off to the races. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it was kind of daunting. It was definitely kind of daunting. And, uh, but the, our, our results were, were pretty good, at least coming out of the fermenter, the results were good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first beer we did was just delicious. And then we unfortunately bottled it in not so clean bottles. Uh, <laughs> and if you have any idea about beer, you know, that's, that's not good. So it, uh, it was, uh, it was, that beer was, was going down the drain after it came out of the bottles. But again, it's lessons learned. And, um, yeah, we we were brewing at least once a week for a couple of years before we actually went pro. And um, so this was independently on your own. Yes, you were doing the com brewing completely. And and uh, it started off on my picnic table in my backyard, and then it moved to uh, Alex's garage in a house he was renting. And uh, yeah, I bet Earth Eagle, as it initially started, was a little smaller than that garage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, uh, like I said, briefly, I, I guess I got my, my real start uh, in San Francisco at Magnolia, just volunteering. And after the first um, day down there in their basement brew pub, I was hooked and wasn't ready to do anything else after that. Uh, I would start calling out of my other job uh, to go volunteer and learn as much as I could. Um, so it's, it was a little seven barrel setup down there. And, um, so we made about 210 gallons at a time. Um, and that led me to a paid position out in Berkeley, California, where we both spent some time. And, uh, that was a much different facility. That was a, it was called Trumer Brow Rye and it was a 50 barrel brew house, uh, pretty much automated. Um, we were producing 30,000 barrels a year. And I like to say I went to the Trumer School of Brewing because I learned the ups and downs of every facet of how to make beer uh, on a you know small scale at Magnolia, but then on a large, large scale at Trumer. And it was uh, eye-opening and really fun to have some really cool toys to play with. Um, <laughs> so that just, then it just kind of snowballed and back to me, uh, me back at Magnolia, uh, being their lead brewer there, and then. Um, I got a call from Dagan, and now we're here in front of you. And if, you, <laughs> if you're looking That's to hard. open your own place, I would suggest finding somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, it seems pretty obvious, um, but someone who either has, you know, honed their skills on their own over a number of years, or someone like Dane, uh, who I didn't just call him out of the blue because he was a friend. It, it was a situation where sort of like a general manager looking for a chef. I found somebody and knew somebody who had cut their teeth in a professional setting. And I do think it's important to have some experience that can then be recreated or replicated in the brewery you're attempting to open. Um, from a more back office standpoint, when you're trying to open your own place, uh, familiarize yourself with your state liquor laws. Call your state commissioner, um, your state liquor commissioner, and they are, while intimidating when they enter your brewery after you open, they can be very helpful in saving you some obstacles that you've either created for yourself or the state has created for you. Um, they tend to be able to guide you through all just the overwhelming minutia of trying to open a brewery in a country that has individual laws for each particular municipality. Um, other than that though, I mean, I. I this is an industry that is perceived as being very fun and very carefree, and it is um, in a lot of ways, but don't go into it with rose-colored glasses thinking that it's just always a party. It is, at the end of the day, it's work. At the end of the day, it's running your own business, and the bottom line is the most important thing. And if you don't have a grasp of how revenue moves in and out of a business, I would suggest reading some books or apprenticing with somebody who does. Great advice. Great advice. And that, that I like what you said about the party because if it really is a party all the time, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. gonna, you're going to go down in flames. And uh, you have to relegate party yeah. at yeah. certain yeah. times. Yeah. 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 
Um, I just want to add, piggyback. So it sounds like you guys had really critical strategic partnerships that got both of your breweries off the ground. Um, so it seems like they were also really natural partnerships, which I think is, is incredible. But if somebody, one of our viewers are interested in starting a brewery and they're like, mm, I don't really have a great partner for that. What do you suggest they seek out in a partnership that will make it that most successful for them? You have to be involved in the, either the person, like we, we clearly all lucked out just into our partnership, but if you're right. seeking something out, then um, you should involve yourself in the industry as much as you can to learn uh, about the people around you in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, networking is, is critical and it's a really easy industry to network when it's- Everyone's got a beard in <laughs> yeah. um, So it, it's, and then your foot's in the door. Like if, if, if your partner's already there, then um, your future partner's already there, uh, then you have an easy into the industry and, and you can grow from there. And luck's a huge thing. I mean, if you don't have financial backing, you're not gonna be able to open a brewery. Um, you know, if you don't have the type of credit to get a bank loan, you're not gonna be able to open a brewery. But I think to Dane's point, the more you immerse yourself in the industry, um, whether that is brewing, whether that's, you know, something else, whether that's botany, uh, the more connections you're going to make, the more you're going to cut your teeth and the more viable of a partner you'll be both in terms of attracting people uh, and in terms of, you know, signing documents. Uh, I'm going to hitchhike on that. It's energy. You know, if you're really into it and you really want to do it, you start working on it and you create energy. And I think that energy attracts other people who are, uh, who are interested. So, um, you know, while there's very concrete steps you can go through to make something like this happen, um, I really believe that if you are re immerse yourself and work towards a goal, you'll, you'll, you'll bump into people. You definitely will. And who says it's got to be a partnership? You know, yeah, you, totally. you may uh, have enough resources at your disposal to make something like that happen. And uh, funny thing about Earth Eagle, no financing. Really? Yeah. We were able to just yeah. upgrade our homebrew equipment just enough yeah. to be able to make beer commercially. So um, it was a little tight, and yeah. you know, as, as a well, and also, I mean, much like you and Alex, the first three months of us being open, this was this was the company. Yeah. You know, we were. Uh, you know, we do have a third partner, someone I worked with for years, um, who was able to help us with some of the finances. Um, but if you're able to accomplish the day in, day out, uh, you know, obligations that you have of, of running a, a brewery or a business where, whether that's day brewing and then hopping onto the, the bar and helping with bartending, uh, you're going to have a leg up because even if you weather hard times, you can always whittle back down and you've got the skill set to be able to do it. That's true. That's great advice. Awesome. So it sounds like you guys had a lot of um, small, small starts that grew into some pretty big things. What was the moment that you were like, huh, this is it. We're real. We're really official now. We, we made it. What was that moment like? Uh, well, I, for, for us at Earth Eagle, I think it was just our opening, our opening day. Yeah. had an amazing line wrapped a couple times in the hallway awesome. and out the door. It was just Alex and I. We were like bumping into each other behind the bar, <laughs> spilling mm -hmm. beers. There's a couple of great pictures of us with our arms all crossed up, you know, pouring yeah. different beers at the same time. And it was just like, whoa, you know, yeah. it was just like. Uh, zero to 100. Yeah, zero, yeah. zero to 100. That's exactly yeah. how I would uh, characterize it. Right. Yeah, our opening day for sure. Um, it was jaw dropping to see the people just flow in the door as soon as we unlocked it and uh, didn't, it felt like it didn't stop all night. Uh, we had friends, um, old, just old friends that came and helped us that day. So we def <laughs> thankfully had four people there. Uh, <laughs> you still had the octopus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it just, it was a surreal day seeing everything. I bet. You're here to drink this that we made. And it keeps coming in waves too. I mean, I, you know, I remember specifically, we had friends from UNH visiting from other states, and we went to our favorite haunt downtown, a bar called The Press Room. Um, and at that point, I think we had like three tap handles out, out in Portsmouth, and we got to sit down with our buddies, and we got to drink a full glass of Shy Baby out at another place. You know, and that just cool. kind of, 
because you're so involved in opening, I mean, you basically live at the brewery in your first, you know, months, uh, being removed from that setting and then seeing it actualized in somebody else's bar, it was that, it's surreal is really the one of the only ways to describe yeah, I, I, that's, it. Yeah, I definitely that's remember that experience yeah, too. The yeah. first time I had one of our beers at somebody oh, else's yeah. stuff. And it's like, it's like being in a band and hearing your rate, your song on the radio. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah. very similar. Awesome. Um, so this is one something we talked about, but I'm just curious. So it sounds like you guys had awesome lines and people to jump on on your opening days. Were they mostly friends and family, or did you do a lot of business like advertising to do for your launch? And it was folks you didn't know. How did you get that kind of a crowd on your first? Uh, well, we. I think like a lot of businesses now, we had a website and we were selling t-shirts long before we had any beer, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that yeah. kind of, you know, the marketing piece, even uh, as homegrown as ours was, I think had a lot to do with it. Um, both Alex and I uh, were members of the uh, Seacoast uh, Homebrewers Club for a few years before that. So, you know, one person tells one person and they tell two and so on and so on. So uh, I think by the time we opened, there was definitely some pent up demand and, um, and, and just a lot of interest. I think we had gotten some, some decent press up until that moment. I think uh, yeah. some of our uh, pals in the, in the local uh, uh, you know, media. Um, well, weren't you the really first good. after like, Portsmouth Brewery? Yeah, after Portsmouth yeah. Brewery, you were the first so 20 years, after, yeah. 20 years yeah. after they opened, right? Yeah, right. it sounds like I think you mentioned earlier, but that echoes the point that embedding yourself in that community is super critical because mm -hmm. that's where you get that that voice that goes past just Absolutely. just you saying I have a grand opening. I mean, do um, your market research. Like, if we, I think, if any of us had opened in a place where we didn't have those deep roots, where it wasn't, I mean, Portsmouth is a small town. At the end of the day, it acts like it's a city, but it's a small town. Yeah. And so the rallying cry spread a lot further than it would if we opened in New York City or if we opened in San Francisco. Agreed. Agreed. It also helps. Uh, typically, breweries open um, much later than their projected opening date. <laughs> so there are months and months uh, to, help, to help promote. Sorry. We had a few different opening dates. <laughs> So a couple of soft lunches. Yeah, and I say like talk to your state commissioner because we were all geared up to open on one day and then got a call that was like, what are you two doing? <laughs> like you have some paperwork to fill out. Oh my God. Um, so we're in Concord, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, it's really funny. All right, so let's talk a little bit about scaling. So it sounds like those are all the, the um, highlights of the very beginning, but how do you go from those, you know, you're figuring out, you're making mistakes as you go to really scaling to the point that you're thriving in this industry? Uh, our, the Earth Eagle business model, I think is, is kind of unique in that we had enough capital of our own and enough equipment to, to get ourselves into the market. Yeah. And then the plan, um, was to let the business grow itself. So rather than borrowing a bunch of money, we just tried to really continue to hone our craft. I mean, our beer was definitely not perfect at that point. And we took all the criticism that we got to heart and really um, you know, tried to tighten up things and clean up things and constantly innovate with what we were pouring. Um, but that did bring in enough income for us to, to you know, uh, to, to scale up, to get a bigger brew house, to take over more of the uh, area in the building that, that we occupied. And uh, so, so yeah, it really, it really was about our success with the, the public and whether they were digging it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> they seemed to like it. So. <laughs> so then when you got your location, did you specifically find somewhere that you could grow into? Like started small and grew, you know, and I, do you think I, that's important versus finding somewhere and yeah, need to relocate? Yeah, I mean, I think any successful brewer or brewing company will tell you that, you know, you're going to grow out of whatever you have yeah. immediately. Right. Right, right. So um, the question is, how keen are you to grow out of what you got? How big do you want to go? Right. Um, we knew right up front that we weren't interested in having our beer in every supermarket and package store. Uh, around so we, we knew that we weren't we didn't need to get that big you know but you know we did want to uh, offer a great um, 
uh, variety of beer to to uh, to our customers and uh, you know get a few kegs out to some of our favorite restaurants and, and bars and whatnot. Um, so awesome. I think we have a very similar model in the fact that we were we are also letting it grow um, as it comes in slow pace and under our own control. Um, not yeah, not getting a hot head saying like, oh, we sold out a beer. Let's you know buy a thirty barrel brew house and try to sell to California. Um, like folks do. Yeah, like and, folks do. and it we we weren't interested in that because we've seen people try to overextend themselves uh, too quickly and it it come back to haunt them or bite them. Um, so we wanted to have a continuous growth. We didn't want to you know we're not at a point where we want to stop yet. Um, mm -hmm. So we're still gonna keep chipping away and chipping away at growing, um, but it doesn't have to happen like that. Um, you know, we'll add another tank here and there. Um, you know, we just purchased the canning line, so that'll be up and running soon. Um, these little incremental steps uh, are what we're looking at for our growth. Yeah, and maybe it's fear, maybe it's prudence, but we don't want to overextend ourselves to the point where we're staring down the barrel of $700,000 loan. Um, this industry, while pubs ain't going away anywhere, they've been around since basically humans have been around. Um, the brewing industry is, it, it, you know, vacillates in terms of its ups and its downs. And I think the model that we've all embraced, which is sell as much as you can out of your own taps, uh, is a really viable one for the scale that we're at. Um, Where the margins are best. Margins are best. Yeah. Um, with that said, uh, you also don't want to undersell yourself. You you know, if you feel like you're in a position where you have momentum, you should capitalize on that. Um, and Dane, like Dane said, we just bought a canning line. Uh, we're bringing in some more bright tanks. And we did that by going out and we did get another loan. It's a manageable loan. It's one that we know our overhead can handle. Um, but we felt like we were in a position of almost consistently, you know, being at each other's throats about how much beer we had, uh, which is a great problem to have, uh, but we wanted to maximize uh, the amount of sales that we could make rather than just kind of sit resting on our laurels and being content with what we have. Awesome. Um, so then as uh, you look to the future of your businesses, where do you feel that's going to take you when you picture growing? It sounds like slow and steady is maybe the advice to win the race. It's funny that you say slow um, and steady, but what? I mean, yeah, but sorry, not that, 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 that Neither of us are that old. Okay, so how long have you, have you both been in brewery for? I guess is a great place to start with that. And then where do you see it going? Well, uh, I started home brewing in 09 mm -hmm. and uh, we opened up the business in 2012. Okay. So not a ton of time, but I guess longer than some people. Oh, maybe. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. I started uh, Magnolia in 2010 um, and we've only been open not two and a half years. So. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot of growth and whether it's it just, is. yeah, not that slow and steady, that's yeah. pretty consistent. And at the end, I think yeah. you want to find, you want to find that happy medium where you can have sustainable income. I mean, I think for a lot of us, this is our life. This is what we want to do until we retire. Um, and maybe you can reach higher highs, but how long that high will last, it's, to me, it's more important to find just Find that line and ride it for as long as you can. You know, it's funny that you mention that. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually in the process of leading our people. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a myriad of reasons. But um, I think the, the main thing is to try and keep it fresh. You, you said that thing about retiring. Yeah. I really thought this was going to be my retirement business. But now here I am and I'm thinking about starting something else up now. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's, it's been a very interesting odyssey. Uh, I think at a certain point, I think Alex and I figured out we didn't need two people to drive this bus. So one of us, uh, you know, had to move on and I had already been feeling itchy and, uh, um, so yeah, so I, so I said, I, I will be that guy. I will, I will, uh, so, so I'm going to be moving on. I'm going to be probably starting something, hopefully in the, in the distilling world, which feels like awesome. a good next step yeah. for somebody who was in brewing. There's some, as you can imagine, some great similarities. But uh, I know that what Alex wants to do now is, is to basically gobble up as much of 
the space in this building as possible. And I think eventually um, he'll buy that. He'll buy that business, that building. So there's several other commercial uh, spaces, and there's six apartment units. Wow. So if I was going to wave my magic wand, it would be like a brew hotel. Right? <laughs> okay. I love uh, that. And if you get out, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've been out, if you've been out to Oregon. <laughs> It's a thing. It's a thing. It's, it's a it. thing. Oh yeah. Interesting. And um, you want to talk about a destination, too, man. Yeah. So funny. Do, you, do you two hope to own a brewery hotel? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, I'd love to do awesome. that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Downtown, especially. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You'd be in prime location. Yeah, as long, as, long as you can get yourself into the elevator, you're good. <laughs> No worries, but yeah, I, I, I think uh, he, he would definitely, uh, you know, I think the plan really is to have a bigger restaurant space. Uh, we definitely need a bigger kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an absurdly tiny uh, kitchen, and um, but again, we're we're we, uh, we're we're trying to grow it, and we're also trying to, as you were talking about before, seize opportunity. You know, if, I'm sure if any of these other businesses that are in that building get, get the slightest signal that they're going to move on or, or, or close or whatever, yeah. it's going to yeah, be on at big time. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We say, you know, you want to have as much space as you possibly can get your hands on in the beginning because you're always going to outgrow it if you're succeeding. But then it's like, okay, where's the line? How much rent do we want to pay in the beginning when our revenue coming in is not that high? Right. Um, right. Small can be beautiful. Yeah. So well, it's can. Been small, it's busy. So yeah, I feel yeah. like when you're growing your audience too, and you're the people that are coming to your, um, to your brewery, I mean, I feel like it helps to have a lot of bodies in the room. Mm -hmm. Or perceptual. Or yes, yeah. yeah. or have a look at it way anyway. Definitely. Yeah. Well, then, um, how about advice for future brewers? Um, do you? Uh, what is the most important thing that each of you have taken away from this process that you wish you knew at the very beginning? Uh, the, the the first thing that comes to mind to me is is your your motivations. What are your motivations? Is this is this interest in beer because you know you got a whiff that maybe you can make a bunch of money because everybody's into craft beer and what a smart investment this would be. If 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 that's the case, I would say look out, mm -hmm. look out because I think uh, with beer there's a there's the soul factor I'll, I'll call it. You you've got to be into it. You really do. And if you're you're an investor, you better make sure you have a brewer who's really got their soul into it because that's, I think, the thing that translates. It's not just, hey, this guy's opening a brewery and he wants to make a bunch of money off of us, so let's go there and drink his beer. Like, no, that's not, that's not how it's gonna work. There's gotta be something, um, uh, you know, maybe more of an abstract or energetic thing going on to pull people in and, um, you know, I think there's plenty of examples of it countrywide, maybe worldwide, of people who got in just to make a quick buck, and guess what? It didn't work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine they don't last. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's yeah. satisfying when those people don't last. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine, right? <laughs> the yeah. carpetbaggers coming in just trying to make some coin. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing, too, that I'll add in there is uh, as much as I would like to believe it's, it's an art and you do what you do and whatever. You, you got to know your science. You really need to know what's going on in those fermenters and in those mash tuns and whatnot. And you've you've got to, as much as you can learn about that, you, you really, uh, it'll pay off. It'll pay off big time. Yeah. I'm going to jump on the, uh, the passion train. I do think, uh, <laughs> I think that is, if not the most critical, uh, it's up there. there. <laughs> we'll go up. Um, it, it, it starts with passion, and if you're not passionate enough to, to keep trying and learning, um, then it's going to be a short road. Um, but if you do have that passion, it's going to be, it's just going to drive you further, and you're going to learn more, and uh, it, take that internship that, you know, doesn't pay anything, but you're going to learn a bunch um, and that is going to lead you. I just think hands-on experience also is critical, whether it's starting at home, um, getting your foot in the door somewhere. I think knowing what you're doing, it sounds silly, but knowing what you're doing is really important. Um, so those two things, and I think they go hand in hand, uh, and one will drive the other. So. And if you are passionate as an owner and as a brewer or as a front of the house person, that inevitably turns into enthusiasm from the customer, which turns into culture. Um, and I think for us, culture is a huge part of what we're trying 
to foster at Liars Match. Uh, but another important element of it, and this is a little, <laughs> it, it, your branding. Your branding is a huge part of how you're going to stand out. Um, we got some really phenomenal advice. Uh, Dane was, is a friend of the owner of Rheingeist, which is a big brewery out in Ohio. Um, and they told us to take our branding budget and triple it. Um, and we did, and we're very happy with the results. And in a, a, a market that is not oversaturated yet, but is definitely saturated, that's one thing that can help you stand out. Amen. In this Instagram world, it's important. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, we read an article recently that said New England IPAs, like their biggest friend is Instagram. Yeah. It's just that people are consistently taking photos and pushing them, and that's really what's inspired, like, their popularity. Yeah, you've got to uh, – that's another thing I, I would add to the list here. You've got to have your social media down. I mean, and the, 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 the only reason, I suppose, we – got as uh, savvy with it as we did is that it was free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we didn't we didn't really have to have a budget to be on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. We definitely needed a budget to get a website up there, which I think is, is really important. Um, people want a story, you know, so it's important to communicate that. But um, yeah, you've, you've got to be on top of all of that, all those platforms to really maximize your exposure and, and again, get your story out. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna add one more thing. Yeah, please. You're gonna work your ass off. Yeah. I, you are gonna work well, your it ass like off. If you think all of you have mentioned living there at the beginning, yeah. right? If you think you're gonna do a nine to fiver to to open the place, I mean, it's just not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And that stress is real. I mean, that stress can be mutating at times, mm -hmm. um, and you have to kind of prepare yourself for that, which I, most rational people do go into opening a business knowing that. Um, which is good. You should know that. The feeling is much different. Uh, so it doesn't the hurt. effect on the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, when uh, Alex and I started out, I had a full-time job. He was able to go into it full-time. So I was sort of a weekend warrior for the first uh, two, two years or so. And uh, if, I remember vividly, there was a certain point where the, the, the rings under his eyes were getting really, really <laughs> pronounced. And, and I was like, okay, it's time. Yeah. It's yeah. time for me to ditch the other job. That really was the thing that made me go, all right. All right. Yeah. yeah, too much on him. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Split, up, split up a little better. Um, so it sounds like you touched on this a little bit, maybe, but what do you feel like would be either one of the, the most challenging thing that you've experienced getting your businesses off the ground and then the most rewarding? We'll go the high and the low. So the realities of it, I suppose. I think, I think, uh, your first crappy review oh, is a that, real tough yeah. one. You've got, for whatever yeah. reason, somebody put something on untapped or, or beer advocate or whatever it is yeah. and, and, and just, uh, you know, skewers you over something that maybe you weren't even aware of that was, that was an issue. Uh, there's something hugely humbling about that, but also, uh, you, you know, you're, you're never, you can never be ready for that when mm -hmm. it happens. It yeah. just, it really stings and it really makes you think about, all right, do I, is this really something I want to do? Is this really, because if it is, you're going to take that feedback and, and, and squeeze something positive out of it. And that's, that's what we've, we've always done. It's like after that initial pain, that initial sting wears off, it's like, okay, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. What were they talking about? All right, let's look at that process. Let's check this. Let's check that. Um, and then I would say on, on the, on the, on the most positive end, you know, um, it's, it's more, more feedback, except positive feedback or, or interest. Like, you know, uh, National Geographic did something on us. Yeah. <laughs> what? That's so uh, cool. yeah. you know, uh, what was it? Atlas Obscura. Um, we're going to be on, uh, Phantom Gourmet, uh, I think next week or the cool. week after. And it's like, you know, again, uh, like ha having a beer, your own beer in somebody else's, uh, bar it's just uh, wild when, when it's out there and it's about you and it's something you made. And so it's, 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 it's the customers, it's the feedback, it's the, that's validation. the lows and the highs, I think, at least yeah. in, in my Hi, experience. There, really close. Um, I guess the thing that shocked me the most, I had never opened anything like Dagan had. Uh, so I was very unaware of local state, federal regulations 
Um, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Not anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, still, actually, they kind of come up with new ones that you do. Yeah. Um, so little things, you're like, what do you mean we can't do that? Like, we can't just serve a pint of beer without anything else. So that was one. Uh, we can't serve beer outside. Why, why not? It's beautiful outside. Um, little just, and that's, those are even bigger than the little ones. But uh, that shocked me how much there was, how many hoops you have to jump through. And thank God Dagan did all the hoop jumping. Uh, he's very good with the city now. Got another well. <laughs> um, it just blew me away that it, it was, you know, if you want to do something, there's going to be some, someone there that is going to regulate it. Um, but on the upside, definitely, like Butch said, uh, getting that positive reinforcement out, out in the wild. Getting a text from my buddy that I brewed with at Smutty Nose that lives in um, Wisconsin and was visiting Arizona saying he saw a Liar's Bench t-shirt. Uh, no way. And he texts you about it and you're like, this is crazy. You know, yeah, our t-shirts out in Arizona. Yeah. Um, that, that kind of thing, it just, it, when it comes back to you, it gives you a nice fresh breath and uh, uh, a little lift. Makes you think maybe you're doing something right yeah. after all. Yeah. Yeah. A, little yeah. a little motivation and yeah. confusion yeah. here and there. Yeah. And, I, and these two both covered the, the hard parts for me, um, or the, the hardest realizations that I had to stomach. Um, and the highs, the highs happen pretty much once a month where we're in the brewery and the beers are flowing and the inside is packed and the light's streaming in and there's like an, a nice din of the crowd in there and the music's bumping and outside there's like people lounging in our beer garden hanging with their dogs and you just kind of look around and take it all in and it when it actualizes itself when it's no longer just an idea and you're kind of immersed in it uh, those those to me are the moments that I just can't get enough of you 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 kind of realize that you're providing a service yeah yeah you know that you're providing this atmosphere this space for people to just relax and uh, kick their chairs away. It's an essential away. space. I mean, the opportunity, there's a reason that brew pubs always almost consistently have those long communal tables. We want people to sit around with one another. We want them to look each other in the eyes. Beer is a great social lubricant, and we have those opportunities to commune with one another. It's, like, really fulfilling. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, TVs. I don't, you guys don't have a TV in your place, do you? We bought one that oh, hides. Uh, okay. It comes out for the patrons. Oh, it's so interesting. Oh, there, are, uh, there are certain things you, you have to sacrifice. You say the patrons or the patriots? The patriots. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we had to. There are certain cost-effective <laughs> things. That, you yeah, have my friends as a deft move. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the patriots. Because, yeah. let's face it, you don't have a TV on a patriots. Sunday, game. And you're going down yeah. there. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 evident. And that's fascinating, right? The, the yeah. link. You, you, I, I had no idea that it seems like most craft beer drinkers are football fans. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, and never football you know, there's, a, really there's another little lesson that I think we probably all of us have gleaned from, from opening. It's like you have to have your principles. You have to abide by those principles. You just don't say yes to everybody and do anything to get noticed. But then you have to have some instances where you're like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we didn't want to have a TV, but we also – but I mean, the, the, the broader point, though, I think, is that if you have an establishment, and you've got a bunch of TVs playing all the time. Guess what? The people in your place are not going to be talking. They're not going to be meeting each other. And another super satisfying uh, experience for me has been hearing stories from people who just ro rolled into Earth Eagle on their own, sat down at the bar and struck up conversations with people who they became friends with. And I'm out with and you know all these relationships apparently have started because we didn't have nine TVs blaring down on everyone and uh, that's that's huge that feels really really good yeah I'm getting some goosebumps now it's <laughs> awesome well I think this is a great moment maybe we can switch over and take some questions from the audience do you guys feel prepared for that yeah sure um so I want to introduce my partner actually who's behind the scenes on this event with me right now um her name is JC Dara she's in this chair she's in <laughs> We're, we're, yeah, she's over here in this chair, so she's like, Just stick your head in there. I know. Wait, 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 wait. Just say hi. Give a wave. At least, like, a, a mystery hand. There it is. Your mystery hand. What a great so, hand, huh? <laughs> so, if you have, um, actually, you know, Jason, you probably can get better directions than I can on the Q&A. Yeah, there's a little um, feature that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can type in your question. Da, 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 da. Yeah. 
Were we that thorough? Yeah, I think we did. We also we did cover quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, right. You guys are all ready, though. Must have driven everyone away. Mm, they still, there are people. I know. There. We still have people. <laughs> There's black ones out there. <laughs> She's like, yes, I'm so sure. Cool. We have one. Mm. This is from Vince, and he says, Do you need to secure a building before you get your license? Oh. Yes, absolutely. So you, it's called a TTB um, or a Brewer's Notice. You have to have both of them. And a uh, very backwards law, uh, you need to have a lease before you can even submit your TTV paperwork. Uh, and that paperwork can take an ambiguous amount of time, like three months to six months to process. Um, we got a lawyer, and I do think that having a lawyer helped expedite the process. Yep. We just uh, winged everything, <laughs> and, it, and it worked out pretty much. It was frustrating at times, but you know, red tape is red tape, and um, yeah, you need to familiarize yourself with mm -hmm. such tape. And yeah, absolutely got to have a space before you. You needed the space, and then uh, you need to outline it with your layout also for the, the federal government um, as part of that application. So you need to know what kind of equipment you're having, what size, where it's going to be, um, all of that in order to apply. And you can build up during that time period. Um, so there are some benefits to that little bit of a waiting period. Um, but word of the wise too, if you've never signed a lease, ask for leasehold improvements and see how many free months you can get. Because sometimes some landlords are forgiving and understand that it's going to be a little bit before you start collecting any revenue. Well, I never really thought of that. Yeah. Of, that you could actually get someone that would give you some flexibility. Yeah, because it's good. It's going to benefit them in the long run. What's the term again? Leasehold improvements. Leasehold improvements. Note to self. <laughs> awesome. All right, the next question is from Peggy, and she says, great webcast. Wish I was drinking your beer right now. Us too. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see oversaturation coming to the craft beer world? Um, not really, no, especially locally. Uh, a lot of people, we were the third downtown Portsmouth brewery. Were you really? Yeah. Wow. And people, when we were opening, people were saying, aren't you worried about you know, all these other breweries in town, and like, not at all, this is, we're not even close to saturating. Um, so locally, definitely not. I think we have room for a lot more, especially in Portsmouth and this just the Seacoast region. Um, and nationally, you're seeing some, some trends. Uh, you're seeing the growth slow down, which might indicate a, a certain level, but um, again, I think there's room for more uh, craft beer to be sold, and it's just, I mean, the, 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 the big beer markets aren't really changing drastically. They're going down maybe by 0.5%, um, but that's not, that's not a ton. Uh, so we can still continue to eat away at their, um, their margins. Um, the, the place I always go to when this question gets asked is the, the reality of, of beer drinking in the United States, and particularly in New Hampshire. As long as the majority of people are still drinking Bud Miller Coors, it's not saturated, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and particularly in New Hampshire, where unlike Maine, unlike Vermont, and I think unlike uh, Massachusetts, not a lot of New Hampshire people drink New Hampshire beer. Mm -hmm. So there's a big curve to climb for New Hampshire breweries. And um, again, most of the beer that's being consumed is from out of state. So I think the more breweries, the more good breweries there are, the better off we're all going to be. I think it's that whole uh, rising tide floats all boats. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a hole in your boat, yeah. right? Yeah, good. So make sure you got no holes in your. Right. At the end of the day, quality is going to win out. Yep. And a certain level of saturation will actually be good because the places that are not producing quality beer will start to fall off when there are better options to be had. Yep. And I think the whole culture of craft beer is really engaging. I think a lot of the Bud Core Miller drinkers never even thought maybe about hanging out at a brewery. But I can guarantee that once you give that a try, you're going to want to come back for more. For and sure. the trends in brewing now, which are moving from just IPA, 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 <laughs> to more obscure styles like the mad scientists over at Earth People Brew, to lagers that are much more fan friendly, so to speak, where those are beers, if you are a Budweiser drinker for your entire life, and you come in and you have one of our no dice pilsners, 
they're close enough that you might be hooked on the craft beer movement. Well, and, and the other thing is that I think it's going to be a real slap in the head to have like a properly executed lager pills in your beer, mm -hmm. you know, and if, if Budweiser is your gig, that's great, but you're really missing out on, on what that style of beer can be or, mm -hmm. or is in a, in a smaller brewery where they're not uh, cutting corners with ingredients to save a buck, that they're actually trying to make it authentic. And yeah, I think that'll be a real awakening for folks who care to give it a try. Awesome. The next question is from Alec. Uh, how long was it from when you first dreamed up your brewery until you served your first beer? Cool. Um, the first thought of the dream of opening the brewery was years. <laughs> um, but I mean, I guess when Dagan made that phone call and then he came out and visited uh, San Francisco, that was like the first, I guess, true first attempt at, uh, at putting something together. Um, so it was a couple of years. Yeah, I would say two, two and a half years. Um, and I would actually say that's kind of fast between the amount of time. And we were fortunate to uh, secure a third partner um, that allowed us to move faster from dream to concept to brick and mortar. Uh, so my partner Alex and I had, had been home brewing and we'd been playing like faux brewery for a while like we had little labels for our beers and you know just but not I don't think either one of us was really thinking like oh we're gonna open a brewery I think we were just having a lot of fun with it and um, as we started getting feedback from family and friends and and uh, you know people in the brew club we kind of looked at each other and said I guess we're we're on to something here we, we probably ought to really think about Doing that, and I think it was a, around two years, maybe from that sort of aha moment uh, to to actually opening up. And and it, and I would agree. I think that is a pretty quick uh, turnaround, turnaround yeah. time. Uh, I think most it's reasonable to think it more four years or five years, really. But it all depends on your your circumstances and uh, you know who's who, yeah what you're going for, what kind of people you have uh, you know in your circle at the time. Mm -hmm. That's good. The next question is from Vince. Are there breweries that you know of here in New Hampshire that offer interning? Um, uh, typically the larger breweries have a bit more space to move um, for extra people. Um, we we had an intern. He, then he got a job briefly before he, he left us. <laughs> um, uh, so I, it, it's totally up to the relationship um, between you and whomever you're trying to find an internship from. Uh, if you don't hit it off, uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, it's probably not going to be a good internship fit. Um, but, you know, that's how, like, like I said, that's how I started, and it just worked out that the head brewer and I just wanted to hang out, uh, and I was interested and curious. Um, so it's just keep popping in and meeting people and talking to them and, Pop in and meet them. We get yeah. emails all the time of people asking for internships. And if you don't have the internal courage to show up and show face, it's it's basically just like someone handing you a flyer on the street. Um, you know, I, you have to find this balance of being like endearing mixed with kind of annoying. Uh, <laughs> it's I think it's called persistence. Uh, <laughs> But if you're showing up all the time and you're just, you know, you're finding the brews that you really are curious about and you're, you know, you're not being too pushy, but you're just saying, whenever there's an opening, please consider me. Um, eventually, that bait will get hooked. I think um, a lot of, uh, most of the brews in New Hampshire, I would dare say, don't have formal internships. But like you guys are talking about, it, it, it's about the right person showing up at the right time. We, we've actually had a couple of uh, interns at Earth Eagle, and one of them that we had, oh, I don't know, three three years ago is now our head brewer. So uh, we definitely, yeah, we, yeah. we definitely, uh, Courtney, if you're out there, hey, Courtney Caslow, also a UNH grad, by the yeah. way. Um, but uh, you, yeah, you've got to show up. You've got to demonstrate some interest in the brewery and you know we get 
the, the emails and the resumes sent to us all the time. And it's like, if we don't know you, we're not probably not going to get to know you. Um, showing up. And, and, and I think actually beyond internships, hiring in general, I think we hire from across the bar. Yeah. Much yeah. more than we do yeah. Yeah. Old, you know, Almost well, exclusively. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's knowing your industry, right? Yeah. I mean, you're not applying to a Fidelity internship. You're applying yeah. applying to you. Exactly. You guys as like people are yeah. looking at yeah. these people mm -hmm. saying, I can I could work with them. I want to be around them. Every Most day. of the breweries in New Hampshire personal, are small enough, small enough where, that, where yeah, that's going to that work. Personal and the, the couple people maybe that have come through that we didn't meet across the bar, they came through some very close contacts yeah. of ours. Right. So, so you guys aren't putting things out on indeed.com. Yeah, okay. That's right. Correct. Right. Uh, don't be afraid to the big breweries. I mean, they've, they've probably got more space. I, I mean, I know I don't want to speak for you, but I feel like working at Trumer was a really positive experience as mm -hmm. someone who was just getting their feet wet. Yep, 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're inevitably, because they're bigger, going to have more spots they need to fill. Uh, I would also say that if, if you homebrew, that's going to be uh, a leg up. Yeah. Versus just uh, I heard about beer and or I like drinking beer, so right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to to have some kind of basic understanding about the whole, the processes is gold, yeah. and it doesn't take a ton of money to get it started either. All right, the next question is from Bobby, and he says, "What was one beer that made you think I could brew this, and how did you go about besting and matching that beer?" Great questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, my Mine was uh, Bridgeport IPA at a Bridgeport Brewing in Oregon. Um, I I love that beer. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a balanced IPA. It's like five and a half percent, so it's not anything um, on the the current cusp of IPAs. But uh, it was just so well rounded, and it just drank. It hit all the spots for me. Um, I was like, this is this is what I wanted to be able to make, um, and so I'll try it. Uh, my version of this story is kind of back ass words. I, I, <laughs> I can't think of, of a scenario like that. What I can say is that, like I said earlier, I got into brewing because I wanted to make the beers that I couldn't find. So we were making these group beers, which are beers with no hops, other herbs and whatnot. And um, so we had been brewing them for a while. And uh, for some reason, we were out in Burlington, Vermont. And we were hanging out at Zero Gravity. And they had a group on their list, which I immediately said, got to have one of those because I don't really know what the hell they taste like. I know, I know what we've been making, but I don't know how that compares to, to any. And, of course, nobody was really making them at the time. Um, so, anyway, the, the, it was a really wonderful moment where I drank that beer and it was familiar. I was like, yeah. This is what we're doing. We, we're in the ballpark with this thing that there, we didn't really have any benchmarks for. So that was a great, that was a great moment. More goosebumps. Yeah, More goosebumps. It was huge. Yeah. Uh, as someone who is not a brewer, I'm not besting anybody. Um, <laughs> I'm sort of like like the panting dog that like rolled over on its back and it's just like just keep petting my belly and keep feeding me beer. Um, but my first like beer memory was uh, <laughs> <It's not laughs> that. I'm lost. Yeah, I acknowledge that I'm not going to be better than you guys. Uh, but I studied abroad, did a study abroad program here at UNH in the Czech Republic. Uh, and we had to walk from our classroom up this giant hill. And every day, me and my classmates would meet at uh, this tiny little foosball bar and get Boudoir Pilsner. And prior to that, I had never drank a beer where you're thirsty you need something to quench your thirst and you can just like put it back but it's not water and it's flavorful it's effervescent and like that beer kind of turned me on to being like this is actually really good so a satisfying low abv beer yeah i mean just like the, the flavor quality of that particular pilsner blew me out of my out of my own head space We've got more. We have one more question from Vince. Hey, Can you describe the amount and type of paperwork that breweries are required to file monthly or annually, and is it difficult or, or, or overwhelming? It's not that it's not that overwhelming once you get a hang of it. Um, so you have to submit to the state of New Hampshire uh, for nano breweries. We have to submit a monthly production report, which brewers keep 
very accurate logs of what they do in the brew house. And if you are insistent on organization, it's just basically going through the numbers and, and filling out a document and mailing it off. And then for this, the federal government, you have to submit as a small brewery two, two quarterly reports. One that's a production report, which is essentially the same thing that you fill out on a monthly basis, just all summed together for that particular quarter. And then an excise tax return, which we didn't know we had to fill out for like the first eight months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that also comes with, uh, with a tax. So I wouldn't say once you get waved through all the initial paperwork, it's actually pretty manageable. Um, I can't speak for if you scale up uh, what would that would mean, but for us, I know it's, it's probably an hour to two hours of work a month. I would say that over and above, uh, you, you have to take this part super seriously. You can't wing it. And it's about, it's really about developing a habit. Mm -hmm. It's about developing the habit of writing down what you're making, taking the notes and doing it on a regular basis. If you're doing that, filling out this paperwork is not a big deal. If you're not doing it, you're kind of screwed. Really. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say, which is sort of related, but not really. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of paperwork, a lot of laws, a lot of, things like that. If you don't like a law, it turns out there's some ways to change them. <laughs> and again, my, my, my business partner, Alex, was probably the, the prime mover in establishing the nano brew classification in New Hampshire. And how did he do that? He went to Concord a couple of times. He talked to some people a couple of times. It wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't a, a grueling thing other than the, the travel miles. So um, there are a lot of really weird laws that are still hanging around in New Hampshire and probably all over New England for that matter. But um, there are definitely um, opportunities to, to have an effect and to change those. And I'll also take the opportunity to make a plug for the New Hampshire Brewers Association. Mm -hmm. I'm the, the current secretary of that organization. And we've actually got a lobbyist. We've actually got uh, some of the mechanics to really uh, make some changes and, and at least very, be very in tune to what's going on um, legislatively in New Hampshire. So uh, I would strongly recommend, regardless of what state you're in, that you hook up with I think every state yeah. by now has yeah. a guild yeah. or an association. Yeah. Use them, get involved, and uh, it's a great way to make things happen. So I don't know if we have a whip or have more questions, but I'm sure we're running low on time. So I would love to, as closing remarks, if you have any last final advice that we haven't covered, and if we've covered, we've talked a lot, so if we've covered it, then that's okay. Um, but also share with our audience how to support you guys and where you're located if they follow you on social media. Some of those takeaways would be awesome. Okay, so Earth Eagle Brewings is in Portsmouth. We're uh, 165 High Street. Um, the front of the building has a couple of interesting businesses, a tattoo place, a homebrew supply, a yoga place. We're actually around the corner of the building, so we're a little off the beaten track. Um, open seven days a week, 1130. Uh, in the morning on. Um, we've got a uh, full bar, we've got uh, a kitchen that cranks out some great food, and of course we usually have between eight and, a, and 14 different beers, and when I say different, I mean different. Um, <laughs> we've got your hop stuff covered, and we've got your unhop stuff covered, so something, awesome. something for everybody. Um, I blanked out on the other part of the question. If you had any last advice oh, last, that we last haven't advice. touched on. Um, I think at this point, the best piece of advice is think about what's going to differentiate your business from my business and their business and, and the other uh, 78 breweries in New Hampshire alone. Um, I don't know that you can jump in and just make a brown and a pale and an IPA and a stout and really, you know, prosper. I'm not sure if that's possible anymore. Um, unless, you know, maybe they're super kick-ass, you've got some great recipes, or maybe you're in a corner of the state that doesn't have anything around, maybe, maybe that'll work. But I think differentiating yourself and uh, the marketing piece that you were talking about are, are huge. Uh, well, Liar's Bend is in Portsmouth as well. We're in the West End down on Islington. 
uh, just tucked behind Fleming Store and Zen Stoneworks front, uh, front warehouse store. Um, got a beer garden in the back. Uh, we have our eight of our own beers on tap at all time. We're open Tuesday through Sunday, closed Mondays. Um, and we hit more of a traditional beer route. Um, we kind of try to stay in, this, in, in style um, and then might kind of put a, a flair on it here and there. Um, but uh, definitely, I mean, I love grits. We just haven't made one yet. That passion guy. train, that's right? Passion, passion train, <laughs> hell yeah. Um, yeah, and then I'll have Dagan kind of plug what we've got going on. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, this weekend, if you want to come check us out, on Sunday we're hosting an Oyster Palooza. Um, it's a celebration of the Great Bay in New Hampshire. Uh, we'll be featuring all local oysters. We'll be doing it in support of the Coastal Conservation Association. Matt Lewis and Matt Decker, who run Franklin Oyster House, will be there doing a pop-up. Um, we've collaborated on a oyster stout, so it's a cool way to see some of the more interesting beers that we do. Uh, but we'll have all eight of our beers on tap. Uh, the beer garden will be open. The garage doors will be open. We're 459 Islington Street. You can follow us on Facebook. Do you need tickets for that event? Do not. Free entry donation encouraged. We used to do it as a ticketed event, but we found it was too exclusive. We want to open this as much to the public as possible. Awesome. Really cool. So um, Jess, we do have, um, if you're interested in learning more about brewing in a more formal way, so um, Jason just popped up on the screen, you can see um, that our uh, professional development and training team here at UNH offers a workshop. Dane, you were mentioned at yeah, the beginning. Yeah, we're speaking we're, on, I believe it's November 1st. So clearly we have some awesome Space speakers as part of that um, workshop series. So if you're looking to get into it and you don't really know where to start, that might be a really great place to get some tangible um, advice, feedback, and hands-on experience. Um, so all of the details are on the screen. Um, UNH also is really embracing brewing because it's become a really popular um, focus for a lot of our students. So if, uh, it sounds like we have a couple students on our webinar, if we do, uh, there is a brewing minor these days, which is pretty awesome too. Um, so that's also on the screen and there's a couple links there for more information. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email that will have all that information. So if you don't get a chance to write it down or that link, we'll get it to you. Um, but I, I think that that's a wrap. Um, JC, do you want to take over? Yeah, we are going to launch a poll. If you could just answer a few questions quickly, it will help us develop our programs. And then the last thing I'd say is thank you again so much to our speakers. You guys are amazing. I think this was great feedback and advice. Um, we'll have the recording of the um, webinar share. So if there's any pieces of the puzzle that you feel like you didn't get a chance to write down, we'll have it for you. Um, and then I don't know if you guys are comfortable with sticking around for a few minutes. Um, if anyone had any lingering questions that we didn't get to um, because of time, um, you can still pop them into that Q&A for the next few minutes, if that works for you guys. Great. Totally. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Awesome. Every, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Go out. Good yes. luck. <laughs> Go get them. Oh yeah, I don't think they can see that. I think oh, that that's that's that us. Real strange. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the wine drinkers oh, get you down. Funny. Yeah. Awesome.